Welcome back. Thank you for joining us for panel discussion number two. I'm glad that uh, the instruction to navigate on air seem to be going so far so good uh, if you've uh, come back and have joined us for this discussion and one that uh, really looking forward to as well now that we've heard a little bit about exactly what a partnership is, what a good a partnership looks like and we've defined uh, partnerships, well then now we have to take the next step and talk about delivering on promises that are made as a part of partnerships and remaining accountable and we're going to hear in this session about uh, emerging approaches and approaches which reset the relationship between government and Indigenous communities and uh, let's introduce our panellists for uh, this uh, this chat. Well, I firstly should say that two of our panelists are, uh, are joining us even more virtually than uh, on this uh, conference. Had to pre-record a couple of the uh, the panelists, uh, the uh, Australian-based panelists for this chat. So, in terms of who will be joining us on the call live, well, it's an all uh, Maori affair. You'll be hearing from uh, Pat Turner uh, a little bit later on, and. Uh, my chat with her uh, before the conference got underway, as well as, well as uh, Tom Kalmer, who is the Chancellor of the University of Canberra and, of course, very distinguished in Indigenous affairs over many years. We'll hear from Tom in just a moment to uh, get us underway. But our first panellist joining us live is uh, Trevor Moake, who is with Treasury New Zealand and is considered, I'm told, as a mover and shaker in Maori circles in New Zealand. And some might say he's a, uh, a sharp hustler when it comes to building Maori capability and leading Crown Maori engagement. I'm told all of this uh, by a reliable source, Trevor. I've, uh, I've not met you before, but uh, you do come highly recommended and, uh, and uh, your work in the New Zealand uh, Treasury uh, speaks for itself. Uh, Trevor, thank you for joining us today on this call. Do you want me to go? Trevor, yeah, firstly, how would you... Um, define define a uh, how how partnerships and, and people should be held accountable uh, in partnerships partnerships with First Nations and with Maori people. Oh, just let me open in language, because uh, without the connection across borders and the connection across time to value land, to value people, to value culture, our uh, proud can't happen, and nor can partner. Uh, so with that in mind, just let, give me a moment. Piki te kaha, piki te ora, piki te wairua ki nua ki a tātou. Ko tū katoa, te nā koutou, te mana whenua, te nā koutou te tangata, e aki aki mai tēnei kaupapa, hui e, tāiki e. I offer greetings to those who host this conference, to the land upon which we are based, to the people uh, who give lift to the aspirations of public servants. Uh, in the challenge for partnership. Greetings to everybody. So with that done, okay, repeat the question. Thank you for that. Um, how um, would you see a partnership, uh, a well-formed partnership based on trust and uh, mutual respect between First Nations people and government, how you then uh, keep each other accountable and how each side is kept accountable in that process. Yeah, I think so. The drivers to um, e even uh, opening a conversation about partnership have to do with the reasons or the why. Uh, and once we've focused on and established what those why reasons are, and they tend to be in the more noble rather than disabling end of what our ambitions are. Uh, so for example, here, we, we aim to lift the living standards of all New Zealanders. And so in doing so, have to be aware across the wide ambit of cultures, ambit of uh, arrangements uh, to achieve that. So there are whys. Do we value social cohesion? Yes. Do we value uh, people who are enabled to achieve their own goals and their own living standards? Yes. Do we, uh, uh, do we need to uh, 
rectify and reconcile things that have gone on in the past and move our society and our communities uh, into upper quartile uh, approaches. If those are yeses, uh, then that's the right context in which to start to think about uh, partnerships. So that's the first part. What are the whys? You know, why are we doing this? Why does it matter? To whom? How do we define what knowledge matters, what proud looks like, and how those successes might promulgate themselves? And that's both a, a policy leadership uh, requirement as well as a, a business and commercial requirement as well as a political uh, requirement. Uh, so I think that's 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 the beginning of it. Uh, the second thing in uh, in our case is uh, is to begin to find ways to reach out and reach across. Uh, often, uh, if we remain within our tanks, we can't find the conversations that were alluded to in the earlier panel session with uh, June Oscar. Uh, you know, Aboriginal High Commissioner, Human Rights Commissioner, excellent. You know, maybe two decades ago, impossible. Uh, but here we are, uh, she's appointed and she's activated. And she was just saying that without the connection to those uh, communities, then we can't begin to understand or unveil uh, other arrangements, other knowledge bases we could bring into play. Does that make sense? So there's some whys uh, and then there's a couple of how-tos but we have to get started on that. Mm. Thank you, Trevor. Now, I want to bounce, uh, I want to hear now from one of our other panellists that couldn't be here with us today, Tom Kalmer. He uh, sends his apologies for not being able to, to be here today, but uh, uh, we had a very interesting chat a short time before the, the conference got underway about his very... Uh, extensive uh, life in uh, public service and uh, his role also as the uh, as the social justice commissioner with the human uh, rights commission some years ago let's now take a listen to uh, professor tom kalmer ao can i begin by recognizing that i'm coming to you from uh, canberra the land of the ngunnawal people and pay respects to elders past and present particularly recognize uh, their youth, as we do with all youth, who are going to be our future leaders, the custodians of our stories, our cultures, our histories, our languages. And it's really important that um, that we, uh, particularly as public servants, and and I, and I use public servant in a in a broader term to reflect everybody that works in in both the public and private sector. Uh, we are servants of of the people we serve. Um, but you know, it's important that we do recognise that. And I'll touch a bit more on that a bit later but yeah in relation to the question i think it's a really mixed bag across the nation as to what partnerships uh, are and what people's understandings of partnerships are and you know i can reflect back to to you know when, when my earlier career in the mid 80s when when the the governor of the day uh, we talked about the aboriginal uh, economic development policy or aboriginal employment development policy and and that was a partnership between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and, and the Commonwealth government at the time. Uh, you know, that lasted a couple of years. Uh, many of us thought it was a, a great initiative uh, uh, from uh, particularly the, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander side, but it, it, it went away. And, and, and really, it's, it's just emerged, uh, you know, over the years, we get all these new partnerships and all this discussion about partnerships. Um, but really, I... I question as to how effective they are. And it hasn't been through want of, of governments trying to look at what a good partnership might uh, constitute. Um, and, and you might remember some who have been in for a while, the old um, COAG trials, where we um, you know, had all these trial sites, seven or eight trial sites around the nation where we're looking at new arrangements. And, and uh, you know, that, that was in the 80s and then and 90s and uh, all well, the 90s, I guess, and uh, you know that was also very challenging. Uh, to to uh, in more recent times, uh, you know, one of the big partnerships was what Kevin Rudd, as Prime Minister, said at the time about the Close the Gap campaign. You know, in in 2007, eight, uh, but in 2008 there was you know the big announcement that the government was going to work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on on um, you know health equality and all the determinants that are impacting 
uh, on health. And, and, you know, there was a new partnership uh, that was going to be developed then. And, you know, it was all, all a lot of hype and we got, we got excited about that. But that, um, you know, over, over a very short time petered out and, and it was a, a very one-sided partnership. But we see some really good partnerships, I guess, around the nation. And, and uh, you know, I think some of the, um, the partnerships with, on, on the environment and, and land management, um, you know, are working um, on the, the, uh, the, the, the national uh, uh, protective areas. And, yeah. uh, you know, those areas are significant, uh, significance to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, where, where, you know, Aboriginal people have, have the relationship with government uh, on land management and control of parks, etc., uh, to um, you know other programs. And I guess we're at a pretty interesting time now, where where again there is the emergence of of a voice to Parliament, and and uh, and that is going to really require a new partnership. And so I think that's going to be the challenge. So we've seen many attempts. We've seen many. Um, Prime Ministers all talk about a new partnership, a new partnership, uh, but I think we've got a long way to go before we can get a real and enduring uh, partnership uh, arrangement. And that's going to require, you know, all parties to to uh, to come together and get some really core principles established that we can all work with. You, you touched on it a bit there, but what, what does a good partnership look like to you? The first thing is that, you know, bureaucrats have got to recognise that writing um, a little script about a partnership is not the end of it. That's the beginning of it. And I really question whether people go back and look at and understand what a partnership's about. It's about a common knowledge um, and, and shared vision and expectations with the parties. It's about respect. It's about empathy. It's about, you know, um, uh, understanding the expectations of both parties and understand that, that you know, you've got to look at it from the frame of reference of, of both parties and unfortunately as bureaucrats we often aren't able to get out to organisations and, and understand we, we do a, a paper exercise and we think we know but but what we know is from our own frames of reference and what, what our knowledge is. Some have had exposure to Aboriginal Trust on the people, others haven't and organisations and and really for me and one of the big challenges is, is really addressing our unconscious biases and and if we can do that and understand why we form our attitudes and what we need to do to change our, our attitudes and understanding, we'll go a long way. But, you know, there's the, the new buzzwords. It's been around for a little while, about co-design. It's more than a word. Co-design is a real relationship, and that's what we we're able to develop through the, um, uh, the co-design exercises on the voice. So, yeah, all of those things contribute to, to um, you know, what a good partnership is. and, and, and you know, our message for for our viewers is that, you know, take on the cultural competency training that the organisation offers you. And um, because not only will it be good for you and your learning, but about your relationships. And again, not only for Aboriginal Trust and other people, but all, all minority groups that, that make up, you know, this broad um, um, society that we live in. And take the opportunity to look at programs like NULA on, on NITV. You know, which is the Aboriginal news and 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 recount of affairs in Aboriginal uh, Australia from an Aboriginal point of view. You know, you get a great understanding. Participate in in Reconciliation Week, Close the Gap. Um, you know, NAIDOC weeks, uh, the 26th of January um, discussions that go on, and really become informed because you know, it's uh, as as a bureaucrat, we're there to service the community, and the best way we can do that is having that empathy and, and relationship with the community and, uh, and uh, having a common and, and respectful understanding of each other. And just one last quick fire one. You, you included plenty of good tips and, and hints for public servants there, but uh, often what can get done uh, often relies on uh, political will, be that uh, the government of the day or the, uh, the secretary and, and deputy secretary level of a, a department. What um, what are the what are the secrets? What are the ways that you've used to uh, convince politicians and and senior public servants in the past to uh, to come around to your ways of thinking on on partnerships? If you've got an example there or or, or others, 
Yeah, look, I, I think it's um, it, that is a challenge, and and the challenge is because again, you know, the issues I talked about about you know frames of reference and and an understanding in a culturally competent way, um, you know, the client base we're working with. I would argue that many ministers uh, don't have that understanding. We are so fortunate at the moment that that our minister for Indigenous Australians is an Indigenous person himself who has a life lived experience and so he can can really relate to it as well as as everybody else's understanding um you know and, and recognizing that that polys are there uh, to represent all of their community but we are an important part of the community because we are the first community of australia aboriginal and torres strait Islander people uh, you know here generations tens of generations thousands of generations before colonization so we've got to understand that, but we've also got to understand that colonisation and the impacts of colonisations are real. The intergenerational, the transgenerational traumas that impact on us, um, you know, they're not made up. Um, you know, they are real health medical issues that, that impact on us. And so it's about getting that understanding. But look, I've, um, I guess, had some successes in, in working with ministers and, uh, um, and, and, and opposition. Um, I, 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 Take a, and all public servants, I think, at, particularly at the more junior levels, um, you know, are apolitical, and we should be, and and we serve the the minister um, or, or the the government of the day, um, you know. But I think we've also got to be very bold, and and uh, if we don't, if we want to really push issues, we've got to do it from, you know, and and I, I say this when I talk to to um, you know from from. Uh, uh, graduate trainees coming into the organisation through to ELs and, and and other levels that we have to be bold. And if we believe in something, we have to present it, we have to argue our case and and to recognise that, that sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. And um, But it's that open dialogue and continually understanding. And I think everybody would benefit by having a, a really good understanding or appreciation of human rights and what human rights are and what they mean. And they're not just some documented evidence. But when you're talking about Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people, go and reflect on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, because that is a one document that captures all rights for all Australians, actually, but uh, with a particular reference on Indigenous peoples of the world. So, so yeah, it's become it's about becoming informed and and you know taking those opportunities I mentioned before. You know, use your Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff networks uh, that are there. And when they organise a, a cultural day or another, you know, information day, particularly those organisations with wraps, um, you know, I know we, we hold events because I, I talk to many of them across departments and, and um, you know, take the advantage and opportunity to, to participate in those and build your knowledge. But, you know, do that. The, the core cultural training, uh, competency training package, um, you know, is a good start, yeah. Tom Kalmer there, and a privilege to speak to him um, a couple of days ago before the conference get underway and hear from uh, him and his nearly 40 years of experience in the Australian public service as a, a diplomat and then an, a ministerial advisor and, of course, then with the uh, Justice Commissioner and, of course, uh, an elder. Most, most importantly, from the Kung, Kungara Khan tribe as well as the, the Wadja tribe in the Northern Territory of Australia. Let's bring, let's go back across the Tasman to you, Trevor. Um, what resonated with with you when it comes to uh, to, to partnerships and uh, making sure that the parties to partnerships are accountable? From what you heard there from from Tom Kalmer. Oh, there's a lot of similarities, and it's clear that his breadth of experience has lots of gems for people to follow. Uh, and it's clear also that his recommendations that we should continuously strive to shift ourselves from uh, the poor behaviour to the upper quartile behaviour where we're finding examples and exemplars of models that can help us and can can work. He mentioned a couple of them. Uh, he mentioned also uh, this tune within uh, governments and within ministers 
and they 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 occur usually every three or four or five years, uh, and then there's a new uh, remit and a new uh, intention. And I think increasingly we need to uh, work to find ways of uh, having a a longer a longer generational look at the impacts for building partnerships instead of just a three to four year slice and then uh, a different approach. Uh, we should be looking at um, a longer haul uh, space uh, in this matter because we all want our environment more sustainable. We want our families successful. Uh, we need uh, uh, our our businesses to be to be prosperous. Those kinds of things, and so that really resonated uh, for some of the experiences we're having here. Uh, in particular, we're, we're we're learning not just in a treaty sense, but in a uh, what makes things work sense. Uh, to reach out into community, to reach out into uh, some of our um, tribal leaders and sector leaders uh, to find options and arrangements uh, to build policy, uh, to design programs uh, and to find ways of moving uh, Māori them just from being advisors uh, to being longer term, middle term evaluators of the quality of programs. And I think that's a shift. Uh, that time we should aspire to them. So I enjoyed listening to um, Tom in that last clip. Thank you. Yeah. I think I also think Dan, you you should be careful who you hang out with at the water cooler over there. Given that introduction you made of me. <laughs> the uh, look. Word, you know, when you've got uh, successful and influential people shaking things up in government, word travels fast, Trevor. <laughs> let's bring in, let's bring in another another uh, panelist for this discussion, uh, Dame Nader Glavish. We're very pleased to say is uh, is joining us on the uh, the call. Her current uh, role uh, is as uh, chief advisor for the Takanga and. Uh, Waitamata District Health Board, but how she got there is a very interesting story because she's uh, considered by many as the uh, the best telephone switchboard operator that New Zealand has ever seen because when she was a humble uh, toll operator in the 1980s, she challenged the might of the then post office government agency and continued to use the greeting Fiora across New Zealand when taking calls in the face of dismissal and uh, and plenty of publicity. But she won the right to continue answering those phone calls in uh, and Maori and has continued to campaign for the rights of her people and, uh, and language ever since. Dame Nader, thank you for joining us today. Kia ora, kia ora, Dan, and I hope you can hear me. Can I barely hear you? And um, kia ora to everyone. Kia ora to the Indigenous on both sides of the Tasman. And um, I'd like to support all the previous speakers, although my um, volume has been challenging, to say the least. Well, we can hear you loud and clear, most importantly. Um, let's... Um, Let's let's start with that that anecdote. Uh, why why was um, saying Kiora when you picked up the phone so so important? And and what do you think it it, it says about relations between Maori and non and non Maori that that uh, that you won that fight and uh, and now say it all the time? Well, I can say I fought the battle, but actually the country won the war, and I was raised by a grandmother. Um, and it was in my grandmother's era that the colonisation had set in um, that wanted to do away with Māori language. They were not allowed, and my mother's generation, and right to my generation, were not allowed to use our language with each other in the schools. And um, my grandmother raised me with our language, and uh, I went to school and nothing about the school reflected what I was being raised in with my grandmother. And, um, and so kia ora is a, is a salutation indigenous to Aotearoa. And everyone who claims to be a Kiwi, a New Zealander, has a right to use it. Um, and so do I. 
at the time and still now today. To me, even though it is, um, you know, it was a big fight back then, but is now normal today, it went to the point about uh, respecting other people and their cultures and their practice, practices and customs, uh, no matter what they are, if you are going to be a, a true partner. What do you say, Dame Nader, uh, in this discussion about uh, remaining accountable in, in partnerships? How do you think that's best done in a, 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 a government um, context or a departmental context? Well, um, there is no doubt you will have been told Te Tiriti or Waitangi, where we have two partners. We have Tangata Whenua and we have Tangata Tiriti. Now, the Tangata Tiriti are those who signed the treaty and then opened up the international doors and brought everybody else in with them. They are still Tangata Tiriti. And um, in terms of of the government and the treaty partner, Te Tiriti or Waitangi partner, um, we've moved away considerably from being advisors to Crown uh, agencies and we have moved into the co-design and co-decide in terms of the delivery of services to to, every, to Māori in particular, you get it right for Māori, you're going to get it right for everybody. And in terms of um, the, the desire by Crown agencies to address the issues of um, poverty is one of them, poor education, high numbers of Māori in the prisons, high numbers of Māori women uh, unwell, and um, all of that, we have to make a stand and we have never achieved anything without making a stand. Kyora was a stand that, that we took and we won. And um, Real Māori is normalised now in this country. It's on TV, it's on radio, it's, on, uh, it's, it's an accepted real in the country used by everybody, as it should be. And, and I guess I can say that the thing that we have um, is that real Māori, we have only one language amongst all the tribes, but we have several dialects and we all understand each other. So we can speak to each other in real Māori um, and, and apply our dialects because the dialects are the identity of, of the tribe we belong to. Mm. Just a reminder that if you wanted to uh, tweet anything that you're hearing in this session or other sessions throughout the conference, the hashtag is hashtag first peoples 21, hashtag first peoples 21. And if you have any thoughts, ideas or questions that spring to mind during these panel discussions, then jot them down. Uh, pull out your smartphone and, and make a note of it because you'll be able to uh, ask and follow up in our yarning circles uh, later on today. Uh, Dame Nada, back to you. You mentioned there it's gone from uh, Maori people being advisors to then co-designers and co deciders in uh, when it comes to policy as as it as things become more equal it, when it becomes a partnership of equals how do maori community members at the grassroots then hold maori leaders and representatives uh, accountable uh, for for things that they do on behalf of um, of a tribe or of a, a, a bigger group of people? The, the important thing um, is that is where the accountability sits. For instance, in Crown agencies, accountability for the delivery of services to Māori is what we are moving into in terms of co-design and co-decide is to create that accountability uh, within Crown agencies to the delivery of services that impact Māori. To our own, we have 
uh, of late. It's, it's, it's not that old um, that we have what's known as the Iwi Chairs Forum. So the 78 plus chairs Iwi that are in the country, the chairs meet and we've split ourselves up into, po into posts of which uh, we have several responsibilities and we report back to the whole forum, the 78 plus, and um, to get sign off. And so we have an accountability process from within to discuss issues that impact everybody, everybody in the country, i.e. fresh water, i.e. climate change, i.e. whānau ora, i.e. everything that we discuss has an impact on the total collective. And so um, we meet four times a year. We report to each other. We get feedback from each other and we get support from each other. And then the whole forum meets with the government to inform the government of our decisions. Thank you, Dame Nader. I want to bring in uh, Pat Turner now, who is the Chief Executive in Australia of the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation. She's the daughter, daughter. of an man and a Gadanchi woman and was raised in Alice Springs and as CEO of Nacho, she's at the forefront of efforts to close the gap in health outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and uh, is also the uh, convener of the Coalition of Peaks, which uh, of course has been involved in establishing the Closing the Gap version 2.0 here in Australia, working uh, alongside government as co-designers for the new Closing the Gap agenda and she's now the co-chair of the Joint Council on Closing the Gap. We had quite an extensive conversation, only some of which you'll hear here, but she did reflect uh, on that first Closing the Gap agenda and, and said that it was an improvement, that there was some funding and that did go some way to closing uh, gaps in outcomes, but it was, and its fatal flaw was, she says, just about governments and it wasn't shared with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island uh, people. The background, in late 2018, a group of community-controlled organisations said enough is enough when it comes to that version of the Closing the Gap agenda. As Pat recounts it, 14 of those community-controlled organisations uh, contacted peak organisations and formed the Coalition of Peaks, which now boasts over 50 members and it engaged with the government to ensure that there would be shared decision making over the uh, the coming decade when it comes to closing the gap. Let's now hear from the chair of the uh, CEO of Nacho and the uh, the co-chair of the uh, Joint Council on Closing the Gap, Pat. We were very clear in terms of the coalition picks in terms of what we wanted included in the national agreement and we successfully negotiated that. So, um, you know, and we have had, Coalition of Peaks have had meetings with the Prime Minister directly himself and with a number of his Cabinet Ministers. So, in a sense, the partnership is not limited to those, you know, like Joint Council and, um, and Partnership Working Group uh, that sit around the formal structures we've established but what we need to do is ensure that this is embedded in the daily thinking of governments in every aspect of government decision making. So that means that cabinets should require ministers to demonstrate how any policy proposal have, uh, have been developed in formal partnership and are consistent to deliver on the uh, commitments in closing the gap in the national agreement on closing the gap. It also means that secretaries of departments' performance agreements require them to demonstrate how they have delivered on the national agreement. So 
It also means that all public servants need to familiarise themselves with those agreements and apply it in their own areas of policy and practice. So I think that, um, you know, we've laid the foundations and we're now um, getting the messaging out through our government uh, partners that everybody needs to get on board with closing the gap and we will be we will all be monitoring and we will be holding all parties accountable for their areas of responsibility in this partnership and you, you mentioned there the, the various ways in which government should be held accountable but if it is a, a, a partnership between peak organizations and the coalition of peaks and government um, how will Aboriginal organisations be held accountable for um, keeping up their end of the bargain and doing their bit to close the gap? Well, I mean, government already has very stringent controls on uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community-controlled organisations through the funding agreements that each uh, uh, agency or department has uh, with those organisations and uh, regular reporting requirements, which I think are far too onerous and need to be streamlined, um, is undertaken. But I think that the government can really reform that area and, uh, and have more and de demonstrate more trust and, uh, and uh, you know, treat us uh, the same as they treat many other organisations that are funded who have nowhere near the accountability provisions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community organisations. And what's next in a partnership sense in terms of the uh, closing the gap agreement? How does this partnership um, become stronger and, as you said, they become embedded at, at, at every level? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, the important thing is that we've set it all out in writing um, in terms of what the priorities are, um, what the responsibilities are, how it will be monitored, how it will be evaluated and how it will be reported upon publicly. So, you know, we are laying the foundations now for a sustainable arrangement to go forward beyond 10 years and if we get it right this time, we should see some real improvements in the closing the gap of outcomes, life outcomes for our people, starting over the next 10 years, but continuing because we've changed the whole um, narrative, if you like, and practice of governments in the way they engage with our people. And Pat, for the um, public servants on the conference, uh, public servants um, at all levels from um, the executive service uh, down to some of the APS's newest members, how would you say that they should um, incorporate the, uh, the closing the gap agreement and the spirit of that agreement in their day-to-day -day work? Good question, Dan. Thank you very much. Um, look I think it's important that all the delegates ring, read their partnership agreement and the national agreement, and they will then have an understanding of how broad this partnership is and how it affects every single public servant. So I would like each delegate at the conference to consider how they bring their own sense of urgency to the task and their own sense of responsibility and accountability to support the shared decision-making with First Nations people in every aspect of their work. If they do that and they remind their senior officers that it is required and that they understand that it is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who decide who from their communities engages with government on their behalf instead of governments just handpicking who they choose to speak to, then they are very important cultural changes that need to be reflected in the way government departments operate. There, who joined me a, a few days ago before the conference got underway, and she also sends her apologies for not being able to uh, be with us here today. Um, 
Trevor, I want to go to you now. Um, the New Zealand wellbeing budget's impact on, on Maori, that's a topic that will be unpacked next month. Can, can you give us a brief overview of, of what that will uh, what that will be, as well as um, the rationale of, uh, of being accountable to, to Maori and how the New Zealand government is tracking on delivering on those promises. And just to let you know, let you both know, all know, uh, we've got about three minutes left for this session. Sure, thanks for the question. I think that um, uh, in thinking about well-being, uh, it reminds ourselves that um, there's multiple facets to wellness and well-being. So here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we've we've taken on board thinking about, you know, what's the, what the social well-being indicators might be. Uh, what are the economic indicators? What might be the environmental? What might be the human and cultural uh, arrangements or aspects uh, in that package? And it's a signal that, you know, beyond our GDP measures, there are other aspects of how you might look at uh, well-being and how you might think about whether people are feeling well and how they're doing and how prosperity is going. And we adapted that by uh, asking Te Ao Māori a big question around how could Te Ao Māori help us think? How could the Māori world, the Māori community, the Māori leadership, uh, the Māori knowledge holders help us think about uh, well-being help us think about how we would progress uh, such efforts. And we, a bit later in the Yarning Circle, I'll talk more specifically about a model that has come from uh, that uh, consultation. Uh, but, uh, you know, without talking dollars and cents about a budget yet to come, some of this thinking is now underpinning uh, the modern Treasury's approach to how we weigh uh, the government's responsibilities, how we uh, how we look at advice across to the Minister of Finance uh, and our government around these matters. So the Treasury is the advisor, uh, but equally the Treasury is responsible for uh, thinking longer term. So the wellbeing budget is a quite a topical thing, uh, Dan, and um, uh, the details will, will unfill, but the thinking behind it is mm. that there's almost this idea of multiple bottom lines, which you have to try and draw together. Uh, how do these things interact with each other? What's the impact mm. upon our climate, our water, our environment? Uh, and if you go back, if you step into, again... Sure, I'm going to have to tell you to hold that thought as well and bring it into the yarning circle. 